I enjoy making these scrolls as a form of stress relief. I um, have been collecting little pearls of wisdom since I was, oh my gosh, since I was in ninth grade, I guess. Um, so back in uh, 76, 75, 76. And I had notebooks that I had all these little sayings written on them and I held on to them for years and put them in a computer file at some point and I've been adding to that file. And um, a few years ago, I actually figured out a way to um, print the file and I found a lot of things in there that were really, I thought really valuable, really neat. Yeah, maybe refrigerator aphorisms, you know, maybe that's all they are. but. I also had some book reports in there, and one of them was on a book that I read on codependence. And um, the interesting thing is that I've made cards and now a scroll about codependence. I've passed them out to people, and I've actually had people stop me on the street and say, hey, you know, this, uh, this is something that really made a big difference in my life. So I wanted to do, I wanted to read a couple of these online. And this is a pretty lengthy one. Um, and again, it's on, it's on codependence, which they call the mother of all psychoses, I believe. I don't know. Um, anyway, here we go. <clears throat> the term codependence coined in the 1980s labels or designates our latent need to control another or be controlled by another. This is often a very corrosive, crippling subconscious need. The entire scenario of controlling or trying to change another person is the antithesis of true love. Rather than entering every relationship with needs that must be met, the emotionally whole person can allow each relationship to exist on its own merit. The relationship is free to become whatever it becomes. For this person, every friendship is an adventure. Every friendship is different. Unlike the codependent, the person walking in love does not require every friend to fit into a self-satisfying role designed to meet his personal needs. Nor does he destroy relationships through his need to control. Every person who controls convinces himself he has a good motive. The controller may even make the motive seem noble. Know this. Control is when we invade a person's life in a way that God himself would not do. Imagine that. We must allow people the freedom to succeed and fail on their own. We can advise them in areas they ask for advice. We can ask them if they want our input. We can never control. Personal growth is an impossibility for the person being controlled as well as for the person who is controlling. If I'm having difficulty relating to you, I can either attempt to control you or I can grow. I can turn to God and ask for the grace to accept you. I can develop new personal skills. I can learn more about you as a person. I can do a thousand positive constructive things or I can do one negative destructive thing. I can attempt to control you. No matter how noble it seems, when we attempt to control, we do it for us, not the other person. Instead of asking why people don't listen to us, maybe we need to ask why we are not listening to them. Instead of demanding that other people understand our needs. If we are walking in love, we will first seek to understand their needs. The person who trusts the power of love realizes that unconditional love has the potential to draw the very best out of a person. If love fails to draw out of a person that which makes them compatible, then we are the ones who must change. Control will only produce disingenuous, insincere behavior that never resonates with the healthy needs of our heart 
for a meaningful relationship. By continually bringing up past hurts, we experience them anew, constantly. As those experiences grow in our emotions, they shape our response to current experiences. When we become aware of the love of God and focus our attention on His love, then His love becomes the emotional resource from which we respond. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. He who does not trust does not know God, for God is trustworthy. He who is fearful does not know God, for God is always present. He who does not know love does not know God, for God is love. One of the crippling paradigms of the codependent lies in the inability to distinguish between responsibility and blame. This was a huge struggle for me. This perceptual problem causes paralysis, a state of irreconcilable conflict. Blame points to the past and determines who should be punished and penalized. Blame has absolutely no value in solving a problem. Blame actually becomes part of rationalizing the problem. Blame futilely says, you broke it, you fix it, then waits, only to be further disappointed. Responsibility, on the other hand, looks to the solution, not the offense, to the future, not the past. Rarely will the one who caused the problem be the one to fix it. Waiting for someone else to resolve your pain makes you a perpetual victim. Someone else may have caused pain. That no longer matters. Ultimately, I am responsible for allowing the hurt to continue. Now it is my responsibility to mentally and emotionally resolve those issues and move on. This is where having a strong connection with my Creator pays off. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, means turn your vengeful thoughts, your pain, your suffering over to me. Don't ask me to smite on your behalf. That may not be my plan. Don't judge. Judgment is above your pay grade. Don't try to heal yourself. Let me be God. The God of love will take vengeance. Dismantle, defuse, and diffuse it. Now relieved of vengeance, the void in our heart may be filled with the Creator's peace and love. Restoration will be complete if only for a blissful, wholesome moment. Imagine that. Embrace it. At the seat of all abuse or codependence issues is a person who has inept interpersonal relationship skills and is incapable of expressing negative feelings in a productive manner. Man, that nails it for me. Emotional perceptions create conflicts that make it impossible to have healthy relationships. The resulting vacuum can lead to all types of dysfunction and addiction. As is said in treatment circles, codependence is the mother of all addictions. No matter what type of addictions you face, the root cause is codependence. The root of codependence is the attempt to meet needs that God alone can meet. We attempt to fill our God-given need for interdependent, meaningful relationships with all manner of codependent substitutes. The void of dysfunction grows as we attempt to fulfill our deepest God-given needs for interdependence, love, and acceptance. And we try to fill those needs with vices like addictions, uh, like sex and drugs, eating too much or too little, violence, just to name a few. So we're trying to fill the voids with those addictions. The void, what we really, really, really want is interdependence love and acceptance from those around us. 
as Billy Crystal says, repeating. <laughs> By continually bringing up the past hurts, we experience them anew constantly. As those experiences grow in our emotions, they shape our response to current experiences. When we become aware of the love of God and focus our attention on His love, then that becomes the emotional resource from which we respond. Think about that. When we become aware of the love of God and focus our attention on His love, then that becomes the emotional resource from which we respond. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. He who does not trust does not know God, for God is trustworthy. He who is fearful does not know God, for God is always present. He who does not know love does not know God, for God is love. It seems detachment is a way of dealing with codependence in a healthy way. That's another scroll and that's another video. These thoughts are kind of a book report from Take Control of Your Life, Escape the Grip of Codependence by James B. Richards. And this is done at Under the Umbrella. <laughs>